with Zoom application. So I'll try again to share the screen. Yes, please do that. Is it okay now? It seems. It seems working. We still don't. Yes, it seems that it's working well. Okay. okay I'm sorry. So uh, I have some problem with the application. I don't know why. It's closing again. Okay. I try to start. Uh, first of all, thanks, uh, Alessandra. Thanks also to Elena Rova for the invitation and obviously to Arwa for the opportunity to present our project. And I also take the opportunity to greet Marc Lebeau, thinking back to the good days of the Arcane project. Um, I'll present the project of the excavation of Kurgan 8 uh, at Uzurama. Uh, when I was the field director, uh, uh, together with the, uh, the direction of the project of Nicola Laneri and Bakhtiar Jalilov, authors of this presentation with me. Uh, based on the <clears throat> case study of the excavation of Kurgan 8 at Uzurama in the district of Ganja, here you can see on the map in the uh, plain of the uh, Kura River in Azerbaijan, brought to light by the archaeologist of Garkap, the Genja region Kurgan archaeological project between 12, uh, 2018 and 2019. In this speech, I would like to analyze how all the practical choices embedded in the archaeological features, production strategies, influence the research results. Whereby archaeological features, I mean both the stratigraphy and the material excavated on field, and whereby production strategies, I mean the practice and strategy of uh, an archaeological excavation. Therefore, I will mainly talk about excavation. I will try to take you on the backstage of our excavation to describe the background of what we generally see on of an excavation when it is presented at the conference or published in a journal. For more detail, detailed information on the historical and cultural context and the excavated materials, I refer you to the preliminary reports listed here and published in Anatolica 2020 and Anes 2019. The Kurgan 8, which I will tell you about, it's one of the 205 Kurgans identified through the preliminary reconnaissance survey in the Uzuraman Plateau. Here, Bakhtiar Jalilov had already excavated Kurgan 1 to 7, and the final publication of this context is being finalized. Therefore, after a general introduction, I will try to show you how the strategy adopted in the excavation of Kurgan 8 has provided unexpected results. Anyway, the excavation of a Kurgan can be considered as an ideal context for experimenting with the excavation strategies and techniques. Due to its specific characteristics of a closed context with overall reasonable dimensions, at least in our case, it was not a simple pit, but it was not a classical archaeological site either, where you had to decide to dig one sector rather than another, making an a priori selection. I start with some very general considerations, which, however, are functional to my reasoning. Archaeology, we know, is the science that studies human civilization and cultures of the past through the collection, documentation, and analysis of the material traces they had left. Now, I would like to focus specifically on what is defined as, as the collection phase, the practice of excavation. I'm aware you will agree with me that the influence of anthropology and the historical artistic approach have 
always influenced archaeology, focusing attention on the theoretical and interpretative aspects of the discipline, leaving the more material and practical issues, the practice of excavation in particular, in a corner. To tell the truth, there was a moment in the last century when questions relating to the method of excavation crossed archaeology with some relevance. This moment culminated with the introduction of the stratigraphic method uh, and the Aris matrix. So the first edition of the principle of archaeological stratigraphy dates back to the 1973. However, the debate has always or usually concerned only on the documentation process and not so much the excavation technique as an actual practice. How you dig is something else than how you document it. These are two different and consequential processes. Simplifying, I invite you to observe this slide, which aims schematically to represent the entire process of an archaeological excavation. The narrowest part, the tip, is where the data are collected, the excavation phase, linked to the technique. In between is the documentation, which is related with the method, Finally, there are interpretation and study, the analysis of the data phase, which are related with theory. Now, try to imagine this scheme as a megaphone, a decision taken at the time of excavation as its repercussion in the documentation phase and then in the interpretation phase. Particularly, if a mistake is made in the excavation phase, for different reasons, obviously, this determines a ripple effect that amplifies the error, and the bad voice speaking into the megaphone is exponentially amplified, first in the method, the documentation, and then the analysis, the theory. With the aggravating circumstances, if you like, that the archaeological excavation does not admit replicas, being destructed, it is not possible to repeat the excavation of a layer once removed because the excavation is not a laboratory experiment. The collection phase, the excavation, is one is the one in which you get your hand dirty. Well, the archaeological data originates precisely in this phase. We often forget this, and we do not give this phase the important is the service considering it a prerogative of technicians, see, in our case, often the workers. This is demonstrated by the fact that, especially in the past, in our excavations, it is above all the workers and not the archaeologists who take care of the excavation. I speak from experience, of course, having worked in Syria, in Turkey, in Iraq, in that colonialist approach, the manual activity of the excavation was generally considered a second class practice. Compared to that of documentation or data analysis, the prerogative of the archaeologist with the capital A. I, will, I would also like to point out that this attitude has often led a discontinuity between those who dig and collect the data, those who document, and those who interpret the context. Only rarely, these three phases are managed by the same person. Therefore, having to start a new excavation, that of Kurgan 8, the first problem we posed was just this. Furthermore, also considering that the workers available in local had no archeological excavation experience, we made the decision to have only archaeologists excavate, leaving only support activities to the worker, a virtue of necessity. But what kind of archaeologists? Now I would like to reflect with you on this aspect, the choice we make when we decide to select the figures that we'll dig, because often we underestimate these decisions. My reflection is inspired by the book, The Craftsman, by the American sociologist Richard Sennett. The volume is a vast and multiple exploration of man's practical knowledge and his ability to produce. 
Senet explored the material culture, and this is familiar for us as archaeologists. Although the archaeologist is never mentioned in the book, there is an aspect in the Senate's reasoning, reasoning that particularly intrigued me as an archaeologist. That of the recovery in the digital era of the intelligence of the ants. Because if you think about it, the ants are the tool that the archaeologists use to dig, except obviously those tools that constitute a sort of simple extension of the end. Senate's book is a dissertation against the division between mind and hand. For Senate, in any productive process, the mind does not come into operation only when the manual work stops. Now, if you think about it, there is a tendency in archaeology to separate the manual activity of excavation from the intellectual activity of documentation and interpretation. Often the ends of the workers carry out the excavation and only later comes the mind of the archaeologist. The real question, however, is that very often on the field, when the workers work, although they have received indications from the supervising archaeologists, they perform a manual activity. Otherwise, if it is the archaeologists who digs, they are aware, or at least they should be, that they are using a technique. For example, it is a technical choice to use the big pick, the small pick, or a trowel to remove a layer. Because borrowing from Catherine Bell, one of his definitions, the archaeologist has an intelligent hand. This intelligence manifests itself in the selection of the right grip of the tools, in the definition of the gestures, in the ability to co coordinate the fingers, in the calibrated exercise of strength. When the archaeologists dig, they are not an animal laborants that use the technique in a mechanical way. The archaeologist is a homo father, which by way is the Italian, title of the Senate's book. As archaeologists, when excavate, we experience what technique is for Senate, an application of mastery based on the necessary connection between hand and head. This technical intelligence develops through the faculties of imagination, motivation, talent, but above all, through training and experience. However, this technical intelligence gains strength in its specificity also for another aspect. Machines and technology have often replaced us in many activities and continue to do so. They replicate our qualities, they work for us, and they exceeded our limits of strength, speed, and precision. However, Archaeological excavation is not one of these activities. Machines and technology have no impact on the excavation, at least in the practical activity of investigation of the stratigraphy. This is not the place, obviously, but I would be very interesting to explore the sensory component of the practical activity of the excavation. The hand transmits sensations, therefore it involves the touch, and the eye allow us to see the different colors, because what the archaeologist does often unconsciously is to coordinate all these sensations. What is certain is that this intense physicality, mostly acquired through proof and repetitions, cannot be fully described through language. Let, let us never forget it. Senet spent dozens of pages trying to make sense of it and tell us, how can you describe a cooking receipt? How can you describe a making of a vase on a wheel? Or how can you describe the operation of a surgeon? There is no effective way using the theory. Because to dig well is not enough to know the Harris matrix uh, or Harris method in theory as it is usually taught in the academic context, because no one can teach you how to use a trowel with theory. It takes practice. So 
we come back to the question we asked before standing, st starting our excavation of Udane. What kind of archaeologist did we want in the field? For sure, an archaeologist with extensive experience on the field. But not only. Here I introduce another aspect that we took into consideration before starting our work at Uzun Rama. Back to our megaphone, let's focus now on the documentation. We all know the problems related to this phase of the archaeological process. In the first place, those relating to the creation of the planimetries. The traditional manual drawing technique are very slow and above all involve the interruption of excavation activities. It is at this stage of operations, perhaps, that the human factor generates so many errors. We have just said that technology and progress have had an irrelevant effect on the practice of excavation. The hands of the archaeologists are irreplaceable. Well, the exact opposite happened in the creation of the planimetries. In this sector, the contrast between the rigorous perfection of the machines and the human individuality of the artisan archaeologist, with all his defects and errors, is best expressed. So, before starting our dig, we talk about how to limit these errors as much as possible. And we came to the conclusion that the best way was to exploit technology. So we decided to abandon the traditional manual method, not the tape of measures, a sheet of paper or a pencil was used at Uzorama, except for the sketches in the excavation book that you can see here on the slide. So we adopted a survey system based on orthophotos, 3D models, and random. I know very well that almost all the excavation now adopt this technology because this system has a great advantage. It greatly reduces both survey times and the margin of error compared to the traditional method, the manual one. But what is not usually done to take full advantage of this technology technology is to use photogrammetry, total station, and special softwares to elaborate a step-by-step -step planimetries. This survey and drawing method being able to provide a three-dimensional restitution, so if done methodically during the excavation, and not only at the end, can give us another view of the excavation of great support in the development of an ongoing strategy. Above all, and this, is, was, and this was our case, if the survey and image processing is carried out not by a technician specialist, somehow extraneous to the excavation who arrived normally with his tool case on the excavation, but by an archeologist, with these specific skills who participate in the excavation and is therefore able to follow its evolution in real time, because technique imply the adoption of an excavation strategy. Following this procedure helped us a lot during the excavation of Kurgan 8, especially when we were faced with a very complicated situation of collapse and peeling layer. Here you can see the situation uh, after the excavation of the filling of the funerary chamber. And so as you can see, it's really, it was really complicated. But the documentation presents another big problem, especially if, as in our case, the project takes place in a foreign country, is mainly scientific and not didactic, and above all, is limited in time. Kurganate was excavated over two seasons between 2018 and 2019 for a total of eight weeks and often with 12 hours working days without interruption during the week. In these cases, once back home, when we work on the documentation, we are not hallowed to say, okay, tomorrow morning after the coffee, I go back on the excavation to check what's wrong. For us, it's impossible. Therefore, the documentation of the excavation must have two requisites. It must be precise and, un and unambiguous, unambiguous in terms of quality, and at the same time, reasonable 
in terms of quantity. I do not want to be pathetic, but I agree what, uh, with the, the Italian archaeologist Enrico Zanini, who defined the Harris matrix beautiful because it gives harmony to the soil with it, which by its nature is not. In my opinion, the matrix is essential because it reduces a complex three dimension system, the archaeological stratigraphy, into two dimensions and in the same time adding a fourth dimension, that of time. But for many, and for me, the matrix in field archaeology should be a tool rather than an end. The matrix must simplify our life in the documentation phase. It is a means that must allow us not to go crazy when the stratigraphic units numbers reach four or five digits. Conversely, if the matrix is an end, following the slogan that we know very well, record now, think later, can sometimes produce a large amount of data that are then managed and studied with difficulty, as you can see here on the slides, it's quite an example. For these reasons, some believe, and I'm among them, that the matrix can somehow be simplified. Over time and with experience, I've realized that an archaeologist, if well prepared for a context, can, for example, decide not to give the same importance to all the stratigraphic unit, practically making a selection determined by his interpretation of the context at the tip of the trowel, as Jan Ode wrote once in one of his publications. Harris, with who I recently had the pleasure to um, uh, discuss metrics and the stratigraphy during a, long, a very long interview, would absolutely disagree. I'm sorry, Edward, but however, this does not mean abdicating the use of the metrics at all. The metrics is what we can define as our imprinting, our formamentis, and our mindset. Selection can, can greatly reduce documentation, but we cannot omit the factor X, arbitrariness. The matrix does not in fact return the real representation of this stratigraphy. The sequence that we establish is abstract because we select the infinite physical relationships between the components of the stratification and we purify them of all the aspects that we with absolute arbitrariness, consider redundant. By digging, we simplify the matrix, drawing a diagram that is not objective, but is the conceptual representation of the stratification itself. And that's what we did in our Kurgan A. I would like to underline this point. Which, which, seems, which seems to me as fundamental as it is neglected. Our practical action of digging, starting from the components that we identify and analyze on the field, is nothing more that, uh, than the product of uh, an interaction between a physical reality, that of the ground, and our ability to interact with it. So the stratigraphic units are not only the product of what happened in the past, the positional or post-depositional phenomena, but they are the product of the condition in which we work at the time of the excavation, of the technique we use, and of the method we follow. Of course, to follow this approach, very good archaeologists are needed, who are organic to the context. To be concrete, for example, those who dig and produce must, the data, must also document and record those data. This simplified approach, paradoxically, seems to go against the idea, over time consolidated, that the realization of the matrix is a mainly technical operation, which every, everyone can do. Maura Medri jokingly defined the matrix as a super Sudoku. 
I'm against this tendency to consider those who dig as a technician. For example, someone considered that uh, archaeologists or a technician can be able to dig anywhere. I personally agree with those who believe that the field archaeologist is a figure that deserves respect both in the academic and professional fields. So back to the questions, what kind of archaeologists work at Don Kurgan A? I cannot find a better profile than the one described by Andrea Carandini, the typologist of human and natural actions in the soil, an organic, we could say holistic figure who cannot fail to have a tremendous practice of excavation and specific skills in different matters and fields, stratigraphy and metrics, survey, history, and theory. Here is our approach. We have imagined our excavation as an artisan laboratory. All this may seem naive to some of you, or some, or some of you. But at the root, there is a very specific idea of doing archaeology. The awareness that the ultimate goal of the archaeologist's work is not to dig objects and bones out of a grave, for example, here in a funerary context, or more generally, it is not to make a list of stratigraphic units of, or unrelated actions. Our task is to understand what those actions were for, put them together in the micro-historical narrative returned by the stratigraphic sequence and come up with the, an historical process. In our specific case, Nicola Laneri happily defined it as a biography of Kurgan A. And here we are then finally, you would say, to the, to the biography of Kurgan A. The excavation of the Kurgans in the various regions where they have been identified from Eastern Europe to the Russian steppe passing through the Caucasus has been for a long time the ground for the most reckless experimentations in the field archaeology. Here you can see some examples of excavation strategies. Open area, sections, trenches, soundings, and witnesses. Sometimes, as in this case, the imagination of the archaeologists took over, where, for example, here, the barber comb technique was experimented. So, sometimes, the imagination of the uh, archaeology really took over. Here, you can see a model of the organ hay after the cleaning and before the uh, excavation. After the cleaning, we had identified a large stone on the surface, which based on the experience of Bakhtiar Jalilov, could have indicated the location of the entrance dromos to the chamber. Here you can see the stone. After the excavation confirmed this hypothesis, the Bakhtiar hypothesis, and therefore I lost my pizza that I had bet with Bakhtiar. Anyway, the temptation to proceed in the simplest and most usual way, that is locate the dromos, dig it and arrive at the entrance of the chamber to outline its perimeter was strong. Then we reflected. Because in the excavation of the Kurgans, one of the problems is to combine the stratigraphy, the vertical dimension, with the topography, the horizontal dimension. For this reason, the problem is often overlooked, and the simple operation of empty both drums and the chamber is carried out to reach a level of denominations and the great woods inside. In the Kurgan 8, we decided to adopt a strategy that would allow us to dig the structures as far as possible in extension, without leaving trenches, sections, or witnesses. The slide here shows the situation after a very strong cleaning and scraping operation on the surface level of the mound. 
This has already received some surprises for us because rather than a uniform circle of stones and pebbles, we were in front of an external single circle of stones, which incorporates a rather uniform nucleus of stones within which two cuts were already visible, these in red. I will return to these discontinuities later. Moreover, in a section of the burial mound, here you can see the part partial destruction the whitish surface here, caused by a tractor to extract the white limestone of the plateau uh, during probably the past years. Thus, after the cleaning, we decided to apply an horizontal decapage of the mound, training to follow each stratigraphic unit and levels. This field excavation technique was introduced for the first time by Leroy Gouran in the 1960s at Pinsevant in one of his excavations. To give you an idea, it's like a dis disassembling a cake layer by layer, following down each surface with own sloping. Now for convenience and clarity as is usually done, I will show you the stratigraphy of the Kurgan starting from its construction from the oldest to the most recent phase. Here you can see the schematic sequence of the Kurgan matrix derived from the application of the stratigraphic method in its simplified version, which we would have adopted as explained before, uh, after, um, above. And for this, for this reason, this matrix, it's a very readable matrix and not a very tangled matrix as usually. The original core of the Kurgan was consisted of a large funerary chamber, about five meters wide and seven meters long, with an east-west orientation. In an initial phase, the virgin soil of the limestone plateau was cut for a deep of about 1.65 meters to create the pits for the funerary chamber and the dromos that uh, was uh, one meter light, or wide and 2.2 meter long. The limits of these pits were filled with matrix walls. Here you can see the traces of the walls around the structure. A small pit filled with the ash was located at the exact center of the funerary chamber here and might have been cut early in the construction process and used it probably for ritual purposes. The excavation in extension on the surface and therefore outside the perimeter of the chamber allowed us to verify that the chamber and the entrance dromos were originally circled by a line of medium-sized stones. Here you can see the circle. He, here there's a, a particular a close up of this. On the top of the chamber and the dromos, the tumulus with a diameter of around 12 meters was erected with stones and pebbles. Only the traces of the outer silk remained of this mound. It is important to note that this circle of stones has nothing to do with those found on the surface which covered it. After its construction, the funerary chamber was used for multiple depositions. Bodies were clustered in the western half of the chamber in a portable attempt to optimize the space and to fill the sector opposite to the tomb entrance. Here you can see, this is the concentration of the deposition on the opposite side of the entrance. I'll talk on the preliminary study on the bones has been carried out by the physical anthropologists, stratigraphic observations suggest that four individuals, two, four, seven, and eight, in brown on the slide, belong to this first phase of deposition. Here you can see the close-up of these burials and some of the grave goods found together with the bones that clearly demonstrate a cultural horizon belonging to a Kuro Arax first or one horizon marked by the presence of vessels of monochrome varnished ware 
typical of this archaeological phase in Western Azerbaijan, as well as other regions of the Southern Caucasus. Individual two was laid inside the grave on a wooden sledge, probably used to transport the dead inside the chamber through the step sloping dromos. Here you can see the imprint of the wood on the floor before here and after the removal of the bones. The excavation of the interior of the chamber and in particular of the levels of collapse and filling above this level of deposition was carried out with great care. Consider that this level of collapse was mainly composed of layers without any archaeological materials or evidence except the remains of the roofing, we really had the impression of doing a geological excavation. Here you can see the situation before the excavation of the filling inside the um, room, the funerary room. At which point we really could have simply emptied the chamber to get to the inhumation level, but we decided to take the more complicated route, starting to follow the levels and each stratigraphic unit with the crazy slopes, which you can see here by looking at the slide. And, they, and that pay off because following the stratigraphic method was fundamental because it allowed us to hypothesize what happened inside the chamber after the deposition phase. First, we verify that after the first deposition phase, the southern wall probably due to a structural failure, collapsed inside the funerary chamber with the exception of the section located to the southwest corner here. The collapse of the wall caused also the collapse of the roofing and uh, that fell inside the chamber, reducing the available space to be used for funerary deposition that was now limited to the portion more or less coinciding with the deposition area of the first phase of deposition. Another strong point of the project was the close collaboration with the anthropologists who have not arrived after the excavation to study the bones as usually happens, but together with the archeologists took part in the recovery of the bones during the excavation. This collaboration has allowed us to hypothesize that the occupants gave rise to a quick intentional rearrangement of the chamber after the collapse of the wall, and to explain also the overlapping of the burials inside the chamber. I take the opportunity, obviously, to thank Ilmar Serdal, Valentina D'Amico, and Mondwen Ulmarsh, our anthropologists. For depositing a few more individuals inside the remaining empty area of the room, the collapsed mud bricks were piled up, part of the collapsed roof and the stones of the mounds were removed, and some of the skeletal remains ascribed to the first phase of deposition were accumulated in the northwest corner where we found them fully disarticulated and perhaps partly delimited by a fragmentary bricks in this corner, exactly here. Inhumation pertaining to the second phase of deposition are three, three, five, and six. Here you can see these are in green, this part of the room. Coming from this level are the pieces of a second carbonized wood sledge. Here you can see the charcoals of this sledge. Some other individuals were deposited in the other only available space inside the dromos here, where the bones were unfortunately found mostly disarticulated. Before the ritual burning of the chamber, a particular and in some ways enigmatic wooden structure was built at the southwest corner of the room above the inhumations. The fire or for the ritual burning of the chamber probably initiated in the wooden structure, which therefore would be a sort of pyre 
In fact, the flames first spread with greater force in the southwestern corner of the room here. Another intentional fire, fire was set probably in the dromos using selected pieces of unburned beams from the collapse of the chamber roof. From its starting point in the dromos, the fire spread to the architrave, which burned down over the pre existing layer of collapse inside the chamber. Here you can see the fire inside the dromos, the architrave here, and you can see here the stratigraphic uh, sequence. So the collapse layer and after the fire with the architrave. Thanks to the precious collaboration of the Italian firefighters with whom we discussed the archaeological data, we can hypothesize the dynamics of the fire inside the chamber. The consequent collapse of the beams and the sliding of the materials from the tumulus must have, at least in part, suffocated the flames, reducing their intensity. For this reason, a part of the wooden boards of the structure remain unburned. Although the wooden beams continue to slowly burn beneath debris. Here you can see two of these. As you can see here in the section, the irregular surface of the depression resulting from the destruction was finally filled. This is the red surface here and here, and the original tumulus was reassessed. Although simply bounded by a small circle of stones and not completely covered by stones, as it must have been originally. In fact, the original mound had already fallen inside the chamber at the time of the first collapse of the wall and the roof. Probably during the filling operation, and this is quite curious, the last inhumation, individual one, light green here on the plan. This is the pieces of the bones together with the uh, vessel. Um, this individual, the individual one, was buried in the northern side of the chamber. A small pit that was dug on the surface of the kurgan, this one, just outside the chamber, below the refilling of the tumulus, and contained only a small jar this one, can be probably associated with the ritual activity performed before the, de the definitive abandonment of the funerary structure. The stratigraphic excavation of the filling also allowed us to hypothesize what type of roof the chamber originally had. The frame of the chamber roof was probably made by long wooden beams which were placed perpendicular to the entranceway. It is likely that the wooden framework of this nature was covered with water and dab, of which we found traces on the filling. On this slide here, you can see a reconstruction extracted from the virtual Kurgan archaeological park. If you want, you can navigate it on our website. As regards the chronological horizon of this phase, four organic samples of seeds, charcoals, and human bones collected within the funerary chamber of the Kurgan have given us a preliminary result that established solid calibrated dates within a range of 3,660 and 3,500. Resuming, the excavation of the funerary chamber of Kurgan A confirmed that data available from confirmed the data available from the other Kurwarax Kurgans excavated in Western Azerbaijan, in which the Kurgan was used for a multiple deposition of the members of the communities accompanied by a very poor set of funerary goods represented mostly by vessels. Another typical aspect of the Kurgans of the Kurwarax period of Western Azerbaijan is the partial burning of the funerary chambers, chamber that has been considered as part of a unique termination ritual within the funerary sequence of the use of the kurgans of this specific period. For being as optimistic as it is superficial, many of these results could also have been achieved by excavating the kurgans in the traditional way, that is simply by emptying the chamber. But 
I dare not imagine how we could have explained the, the collapse of the bricks of the roof, the two stages of the position, and the singular, singular inhumation one floating in the field. This was only possible thanks to the technical ability of the excavators, the real-time reading of the stratigraphy, and the support of photogrammetry and renderings. However, where our strategy of excava excavating pulled the decision, the most significant and unexpected results was when we realized that the stone circles found, found on the surface, the later mound, was not directly related to the burial chamber. And the early mound, uh, with the burial chamber and the early mound, and had been built much, much more later. Conversely, if we had simply excavated the chamber without investigating its context, we could have assumed that the stone structure visible on the surface was related to the burial chamber in a single complex. And we might have attributed to the incapacity of the buildings the fact that it was completely off-centered from the mound. In fact, after a long phase of abandonment of the seeded first organ, the visibility of the burial mound was probably used as a proxy for setting up a new organ. Two graves belong to this phase, and the black burnished ware vessels of the remaining grave goods allowed us to suggest for the new Kurgan, a date to the post Kuro Arax phase or early Kurgan period, about 2500 2000 before, uh, before Christ. Here you can see the schematic plan with the overlapping of the two mounds, the first and the second, and the position of the two graves on, of the second Kurgan. Grade one contained the disturbed remains of one individual together with few funerary goods. On the southeast side of the tomb, a deposit of animal bones, including those of a snake, was found. And grade two contained the single deposition. A preserved beam found near the grave suggests that it had a wooden roof that was probably removed by the looters, who probably took out some of the precious objects, as well as disturbing the buried individual. Animal offerings, ceramic vessels, and the bronze dagger were found inside the pit. Here you can see the two mounds in yellow, the first on the left and oldest, with the funeral chamber dated back to the middle of the fourth millennium, and in blue on the right, the second and latest one with the two graves indicated in red, dated back to the mid third millennium. The location of the graves in red that, uh, that were embedded into the old Kuro Arax Kurgan, the yellow one, has a clear symbolic association. They disturbed only the walls of the previous funerary chamber and not the chamber itself. The second and later Kurgan, in blue on the slide, incorporates the first two walls, but is composed by an inner circle of stones separated from an external circle of stones by an intermediate path that might have been used for the performance of some ritual activities. It is important to note that the two burials are practically centered with respect to the second Kurgan, and this led us to hypothesize that they were excavated at the same time when a new surface mound was made. Moreover, from the overlapping of the planimetries of the two mounds, it is clear that these are not concentric. In fact, while the oldest has a pretty much perfect circular shape, the more recent has one has an oblong, irregular outer ring about 16 meters north to south and 18 meters east to west. However, and this is significant, they converged both on a tangent point at the entrance of the dromos, where a large stone, like a real funerary situs, here inside the green circle was located. I was telling you earlier about these stones. This is the pizza stone. Unfortunately, we do not know exactly when, but both the grave one and two were looted most 
likely by someone who knew the location below the stone mound. We can infer this from the fact that the looting pits seems to be very punctual. The fact that the tombs were violated also explain why the pits cut the stone circles of the kurgan by which they were originally covered and with which they were originally associated. Again, it was the context that allowed us to this association. Otherwise, having identified them during the surface scrapping, we would simply have concluded that they were two larger graves cutting later the mound associated with the funerary chamber. So if the expectation was to dig a Stadner organ, in the end, what we have brought to light is a funerary complex in use for more than 1,000 years, cons consisting of a first mound with two phases of deposition, an intermediate collapse and the river burning of the burial chamber, and the second mound, with which two burials are associated. As I wrote in the outset of this speech, the result has therefore returned the complexity of this funerary context, assimilating it to a short film rather than a snapshot. In conclusion, what I want I would like to underline is that the particularity of this context is not accidental, but is it the result of what I stated at the beginning of this speech. How all the practical choices embedded in the archaeological fisheries production strategies influence the research results. This want to be our very small contribution in the specific sector of the funerary archaeology of the Caucasus in the hope that uh, this way of working can affect above all the students and young researchers engaged in this branch of study, with the expectation that they can understand, if still needed, that the ultimate goal of the archaeologists' work in this context simply cannot to be to dig objects and bones out of a grave, but investigate their complexity in four dimensions. Before finishing my speech, let me thank all the institutions that support the project, CAMNES in Florence, the University of Catania, and the National Academy of Science of Azerbaijan, the Italian Ministero degli Affari Esteri, the LDM Institute here in Florence, and the Fondazione OL Mediterraneo Antico, and the governor of the city of Ganja. And finally, I will deeply thank the workers on the site, obviously, and all the scholars, researchers, and students who participate in the excavations, Chiara, Alice, Rachele, Martina, Lola, in particular, Lorenzo Crescioli, expert in photogrammetry and uh, 3D rendering, and obviously, the two directors of the project, Battiar Jalilov and Nicola Laneri, who have led this very small group like a motivate elite group on the excavation. So I thank you for the attention. Thank you so much, Stefano. This was a truly wonderful talk. I enjoyed it both uh, in the first theoretical part and in the second. Congratulations for this excellent excavation. It is really a pleasure, I think, for every archaeologist who is passionate about, about um, field work. To, to, to see a, a, a well excavated series of contexts. It's just, it's just very nice. It's, it, and it's, uh, I think, absolutely enlightening about how, how we can now approach excavating a Kurgan. I mean, probably, as you said, other strategies would, would uh, show a somewhat different story, but I am still quite convinced that your path has been um, truly, truly the most uh, interesting so far in, in, in this kind of excavation. So um, I uh, noticed that uh, um, Nicola uh, has joined us, by the way, during your speech. So welcome to Nicola. Yes, he's still there. And uh, thank you, Alessandra. Ciao. Ciao. And so now uh, I hope that uh, um, I hope I believe that there will be some 
some questions for you. I certainly have some, but I also invite uh, all, all those who are participating, if they don't feel like they want to, 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 to speak up, just to write down a message, a comment or a feedback um, in the chat, I will be um, looking for it. And um, in the meantime, um, before Elena disappears, perhaps Elena, you want to add, I know that you have to go quite soon, but if you want to take the chance and say a couple of concluding words. Yes, thank you, Alessandra. Uh, but I will I will try to remain until the end because this is really this was really a very interesting lecture and I want to hear the the discussion as well. So I want to first of all to thank Stefano and uh, and uh, Nicola as well for um, participating to this uh, program of lectures and actually inaugurating it. And uh, um, yes, I have uh, some uh, some comments. I mean, I, I think this clearly uh, shows us to uh, how how much we we can uh, in fact uh, uh, get from the excavation of a kurgan, which of which many were excavated, but uh, with. Uh, um, standard results and there is uh, in fact a whole world let's say to still to be discovered from uh, applying well just careful excavation excavation techniques and what for instance came to my to my mind is that if this organ hadn't been excavated in this way maybe uh, the, um, one could have even concluded that this was a, a grave, a single grave, which was used from the cooler access period to the post cooler access period, and that even maybe it could have been concluded that the, uh, the pottery from the first uh, phase and from the from the later later graves was uh, more or less contemporary, if uh, no C fourteen dates uh, hadn't been uh, hadn't been um, uh, taken. So I mean, it's I, I think this was the case uh, for some uh, um, for some uh, previously excavated kurgans where they. Allegedly found the cooler uh, access and post cooler access uh, pottery together. But even more in even more interesting, I think, is the the, the fact that uh, it was discovered that these were actually two different kurgans, and the, and that kurgans were somehow. Uh, reused, readapted. There are a couple of other cases, and I think this was much more uh, common than we than we realize. So, well, thank you, thank you, Stefano and uh, and uh, Nicola for uh, uh, showing this so so clearly. I have one one question only about the covering. So you think the original kurgan was co also covered with stones, or or maybe it was just covered with earth, and there was just a circle of stones about it? Do you have any any hint we, about that? The only evidence that we have it is that for sure there was a, a circle of stones around the funeral chamber, but what we can suppose is that also the original Kurgan has a, a, a roof of stones and pebbles because inside the funerary chamber, in the filling, we excavated tons of stones and pebbles. So probably it was the result of the uh, collapse inside the funerary chamber. But this is an hypothesis that we uh, no So you didn't find, for instance, above the collapsed roof, a, a clear layer of collapsed stones? 
we found a layer with mixed stones and dirt because of the gravity, you know, stones yes. uh, go down in the dirt. But uh, yes, we had the impression that the original covering of the, of the roofing of the mound was by stones, as in the second and later case. Okay, thank you. So are there any other questions? Well, while everybody is still perhaps thinking, I have a, a couple of questions. Um, two questions on your more philosophical introduction, theoretical slash philosophical, I would really say, and a couple of questions on the context. Um, the philosophical questions is, well, no, no, this is more like a, a, a theoretical questions. I mean, I subscribe, I, I completely agree with the, practically every detail of what you said. So, but there is one point that I'm not sure I agree. And it is the fact that you, in your sketch of the ideal archeologist, your ideal archeologist is informed about the history of the place he is excavating. Um, Yes, this seems banal, but it contradicts what uh, our German colleagues taught me in my years in Tübingen. They wanted the documenters, so to say, to know nothing about the context in search of, you know, a sort of uh, objective uh, view of what you had in front of you. And I already see your expression and we don't agree, this is bullshit, but there is a little bit of truth. For example, in the South Caucasus, a lot of local archaeologists are really, truly well informed about uh, uh, the context and the history. They really know a lot, but it seems that they are a little bit trapped into um, con um, uh, uh, interpretations that you know developed uh, in uh, in in decades of research and that are, it's sometimes difficult to jump uh, beyond your shadow so to say and sometimes we really need to jump beyond our shadows so i think the ideal archaeologist sometimes may be disinformed about uh, uh, about history and context while I feel he must always be very well aware of the geomorphology of what uh, of, of, of the context. And this, I think, is absolutely, uh, uh, you know, necessary to understand what's going on in, in excavating. But about the history, question mark. And this is a little bit a provocation because our Italian school, of course, has played so much uh, accent on the necessity to know about history, of course. Um, second question is just, it's everything very nice, but if you have no money and you want to excavate, you have to do with what you have. And where do you find all these wonderful archeologists working for nothing? Uh, second questions. And then moving on to the context, first of all, I was wondering whether uh, the fire that you described taking place inside the chamber had a spectacular, um, uh, can be intended as a spectacular show somehow. Uh, so had some sort of uh, visibility and uh, I don't know, collapsing, if, if every, if, if, if it was something intended to create, you know, some, some sort of pyrotechnic effect. And uh, uh, last question. Yes, I agree. We should, ex uh, you know, enlarge your approach, which I would really like to be also my approach if I am able to do, but also around the Kurgans. So not only, you know, uh, now we are at the point that we understood that we have to excavate the Kurgan according to stratigraphy, but now perhaps we shall take a step forward and also ex explore like 
10 meters around the Kurgans, what's there? And uh, I expect a lot of interesting uh, results by doing uh, this step. Okay. I'll leave the answer at the third questions at, to Nicola if he wants to comment. If not, I can say something. Yeah, okay. yeah. Stefano. I, I start. Uh, I Whenever st you want, you start with it and then I'll add some more stuff. Okay, don't worry. I go, I follow the order. So first and second. Uh, you know, th this is a really a choice a choose of field. So you, you, you have to decide in which part of the archaeology you stay, because both are possible. So our approach is a possible approach. Anyway, it was really a very singular. I'm sorry, because the coffee machine started to work. Uh, our situation was quite uh, unusual and quite good because uh, there we had the possibility to have the experience of Bakhtiar Jalilov that knows very well the context. After both Nicola first and also I, we are uh, specialists especially, of funerary archaeology and also read works. So this is the second point. And after uh, the team was composed by res uh, young researchers. So they were very motivated on the field. So you are, you, you are right when you say that you need the money to do a kind of excavation like this, but also you can manage the team motivating the people is, that excavate the context. And I think that the, the academic approach can be really useful because you can join the didactic experience with the academic and scientific approach to the context. Uh, I believe that uh, archaeologists cannot excavate everywhere. Oh, they can do. So this is the approach of Harris, for example. When I discussed this with uh, Edward during our interview, it, it is convinced that an archaeologist can excavate everywhere with the same method, the Eric's, Eric's method. I don't believe because uh, I think that uh, it's important to have an idea of the context, of the history of the context, and also of the type of the context. So chronology, type, and functional use of the context. So um, I really believe that this is the ideal situation, the ideal situation, you know? So after that, there's reality and the practice and so we have to manage the possibility that we have. Uh, the last question, I, I also leave the answer to Nicola, just I have to introduce that uh, we moved from the Kurgan's uh, experience, and now we are excavating a settlement, a surface settlement. And so we are trying to follow the traces of the relation between the funerary context and the settlements related or possibly related with the Kurgan's. Nicola, it's your turn. Also, Bakhtiar is online. I saw him on the web. Come. Okay, first of all, thank you, Stefano, for the uh, lecture, uh, for being here. And thank you, Elena, for your comments and Alessandra. Uh, we have some uh, updates also on, on, on what we've been working on the, the project uh, more recently. We expanded with a PhD uh, project that uh, will be discussed in June, July by Chiara Papalardo. And uh, she's gonna apply a view shed analysis on the visibility of the Kurgans. And uh, I believe, I agree with uh, Alessandra, I think the visibility was uh, a mean for uh, showing a, sign of a, a scenery 
with sort of, uh, I don't want to call fireworks, but more like volcano effects with the fire that was visible from um, almost everywhere. Also, the fact that the, the, the Kurgan was probably, the, 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 the coloration of the Kurgan was almost whitish. And um, going back also to Elena's question, I believe that uh, there were no stones, at least in one phase, it was all like uh, uh, whitewashed. And so this is what we think. There was probably a collapse and, uh, and, uh, and the fire was coming from uh, either a chimney or from the center of the, uh, of the chamber. And on this, we have a new uh, PhD project by, that I see connected, Alicia Mendola, and she's gonna work on sampling uh, from every single uh, Kurorax um, Kurgans excavated by Bakhtiar and also from Kurgan 8. Uh, uh, samples to understand the level of temperature and how the fire was used uh, in the funerary chambers. And the uh, last project that uh, it's uh, uh, important for us, and this is with uh, one of your former students, Anna Paola Passerini, Cornell and Stewart, it's the chronology. Uh, together also with Giulio Palumbi, that just uh, told me to send some uh, um, skeleton samples to Germany for the project he's running with the DAI. Uh, and with uh, Anna Paola and Stuart, we're going to try to find a more fitting chronology. As you probably know, this uh, Kurganate is the most ancient uh, Kurgan for the Kuror Axis uh, period in, uh, in, in, this, uh, in, the, in the Southern Caucasus, dated to around 3600 uh, uh, BC. I want to add also about the, uh, um, Alessandro's comment on the history and not understanding the history. I think it's important to understand the, 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 the history through uh, what we've done, because uh, um, we also have to add on that, for example, the intrusive burial was uh, previously excavated by somebody else. We don't know exactly when, probably during the late Bronze Age period, so around uh, 1200, this is uh, our uh, dates for this period. And uh, half of the body of the person who was buried in the intrusive burial was taken away together with part of the funerary goods. So I think it's important to understand the history, even recent history on uh, using, on how people have been using the area and how people have been using the, um, the Kurgans. And uh, I think uh, it, it's important to combine different types of researches on, on, on these topics and trying to combine what Stefan has been doing with what we're doing uh, with uh, the PhD students and this project with Anna Paola Passerini. Uh, regarding the last part of Stefan's uh, uh, talk by the, the response to your question. We are in Tavatepe, that is in the Astava province. We are starting to combine uh, a settlement analysis of the early Middle Iron Age period with the uh, Kurgans of this period. And we're going to try to understand how um, the use of Kurgans has been transformed throughout uh, uh, the, the millennia of occupation of uh, this uh, broad area. So I hope I was not too long and I was clear enough. Thank you. Thank you, Nicola. No, no, you were not too long. It's it's a pleasure to hear you talk about your wonderful project. I think we are all expecting a lot of news from you and it's just been wonderful to learn more about how you work. And by the way, I, I'm not, I'm, uh, with my note, I was not implying that we shouldn't know anything about the history of anything and just excavate layers, but rather just uh, as Stefano said, I think uh, archeological equips are really enriched by mixture of, um, well-informed archaeologists sharing a stratigraphic approach, but perhaps not necessarily a deep knowledge of the ongoing debate about reconstruction of history in a specific reasons, region. Because, for example, um, people coming to Italy with no idea whatsoever about Italian archaeology sometimes come up with really creative solutions to interpret new contexts. And so I really uh, always um, expect with surprise and interest what um, archaeologists coming from other perspectives 
come up to to explain uh, well-known context. So that was my point. It was just in a way to to welcome a mixture of uh, of, uh, of expertise uh, in this sense, rather than you know dismissing studying history or something like that. No, no, but um, I like your German approach, anti-historical. I'm just. Uh, I was just like, say it's sometimes it's complicated. I agree with you. Uh, like, you know, we're starting a new project in Iraq and sometimes uh, we decided to go with this German approach. Like, we, I don't want to know anything about the previous history of the excavation, but then you deal with problems that, uh, and, and you need a source. And it's fascinating to bounce back and forth between knowing and not knowing. And I agree with you. It's like, a, it, it's a fascinating approach to, to know, to not know. I don't know. Sex kind of yeah, we must keep it dialectic. Anyway, I, I don't want this to monopolize our our discussion. It was anyway really compelling. Everything you noted and said. Um, any other questions from our public? Even clarifying question. I see a couple of students among the public. If they like to uh, say something, ah, Pavel has a question. Not a student, but. The co-director of my project, please. Yes, hello. So thank you, thank you very much for this uh, fascinating presentation. I enjoyed it very much, um, and huge compliments to the to the team, the entire team. Uh, one of my questions was actually answered by uh, by Nicola. Uh, I was interested in the potential for dendrochronology. Which is in process, as I understood, and but I have also a second question, um, the technical one, since uh, you had this beautiful cleaning of uh, each layer that you excavated, and it's a huge area. Are you using only brushes, or are you using some kind of high-tech um, vacuum cleaners of industrial standards? I was impressed. I want just to know. Thank you. No, we use it only trowels and brushes. Brushes, wow. Yeah, of course. Sometimes we also use the big pick. This is really, um, when you are in front of uh, a context, uh, really the archaeologist archeology, has to decide which kind of instrument to use for this. Sure. And this is important because only an archaeologist can decide. And Coming back just uh, to the words of uh, Alessandra, I also would like to add that uh, a joint project like us and most of the projects that are starting now in the, in the Middle East uh, are joint projects. And the, I think it, this is really important because uh, I, I, I thank you, I thank Bakhtiar for this, because when we arrived there, we are not exactly specialists on this context. But due to the experience of Batyar, we develop our experience on the field. So I remember again that when we arrived and we finished the clean of the Kurgan, Batyar told me, okay, here we have the dromos. And for me, it's like, uh, how can you recognize that this is the dromos? But at, at the point we bet the pizza, because I told Bakhtiar, okay, now we start the excavation and after we check, but at the end it was right, because it was exactly when he indicated me the dromos were. So I think it's important to have uh, archeologists that, uh, work on the context in the country in which we uh, start projects. This is, I think, one important thing to underline. Yes. By the way, this was also, I think, our own experience in many occasions, of course. Um, Elena, would you like perhaps to say a couple of closing words? I think is if there is any other questions, but I don't see any hands up. No, no questions. There are no other questions. So, so 
Yes, I think this was a, a very brilliant uh, beginning for our uh, series of lectures, and we, we really hope it will go on uh, like, uh, like this. Just uh, I wanted to say, uh, I mean, um, last few words about the theme, uh, whether it's, uh, it's better to come with no experience, with no knowledge, or, well, I definitely think it's better to come with uh, at least an idea of what, uh, what are the historical questions. And certainly you have to come with technical expertise, which is not uh, uh, limited to that. And you have to, uh, I mean, be open to suggestions to people who come from a totally different experience. But I think if, if you have no idea of the, of the local, uh, I mean, conditions, even uh, soil conditions, and especially of the local, uh, uh, I mean, uh, what was the previous experience, you, you uh, may uh, make uh, uh, very, very big mistakes in the beginning. So it's, it's really important to at least uh, to, to have, uh, to at least to, to create, if, if you are a newcomer, to create uh, some uh, yourself, yourself uh, uh, some knowledge. But I mean, there are different opinions and we can, maybe we can develop this theme in the following, in the following lec le lectures. So wh when is our next appointment? Can you remind uh, us, Alessandra? Uh, just, just one addition. I think that uh, um, we need a bricolage approach to archaeology, mm -hmm. also in creating our own instruments. OK, the trowels, OK, the pickaxe, but it's interesting. You know, sometimes we can adapt and hack existing in instruments for the solutions of the given soils. I mean, mm. uh, this very down to earth, well, sorry for the bad word game uh, approach. I think it is uh, like very creative uh, of new information. Um, I mean, I, I can think of a series of, of newly created or hacked instruments that really changed uh, the way an, uh, a site is excavated. Uh, from high-tech solutions, Pavel, I really truly hope that we are buying, a, you know, solar power, the vacuum cleaner for next year, but whatever, to low-tech solutions like self-made instruments for excavating that can be very effective. But okay, this is just me droning on. And now I would like uh, you to show, to share with you uh, the next... Um, uh, uh, the, the program, sorry, no, exactly. So on the 2nd of February will be the next uh, uh, occasion and Shorena Davitashvili will be speaking on the late bronze, early Iron Age sanctuary of Nazar Lebi in Georgia and its deposits. Mm, by the way, uh, we had some problems, um, particularly in uh, divulging this uh, first uh, uh, appointment to Agade Sasson mailing list. It didn't work, which was our main avenue to publicize it. So sorry for that, uh, uh, Stefano and Nicola. Uh, this this uh, was very unfortunate and we are sorry, but this your, uh, your paper will be uh, online. And I think anyway, this is uh, uh, more uh, has more views than a singular conference. And I'm very happy that it will be so because I will be certainly suggesting that my students hear um, hear uh, your talk. I thought it was very also thought provoking in the first part, even people who are, have no interest whatsoever in excavating a Kurgan uh, may find inspiration in your uh, approach uh, uh, from, a, from a theoretical point of view. So it, it will be online and I will share with you the link as, uh, as, uh, as soon as I have it. Uh, it's the first time for us, so sorry the, 
somehow uh, hobbling uh, procedures. Now I uh, uh, stop my sharing uh, I, and return. Sorry, I don't know how to do that, but. Uh, uh, no. I, I cannot do that, but perhaps it's not so important. So um, I think uh, Stefano, uh, Nicola, Bakhtiar, I think uh, I identified you now in the public. public uh, so um, many thanks to having uh, inaugurated our lecture series with this really wonderful and difficult to top talk. And um, so I hope to see you soon. Perhaps uh, you will pop in in uh, some others of our lectures to, to give us and share with us your wisdom. And congratulations for your work and all the best. Oh. Ciao. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Ciao, ciao. Ciao. Bye-bye. Thank ciao. you, everybody. Ciao. Ciao. And see ciao. you soon. Ciao.